<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here on this beautiful Sunday. It's very hairy. We have this weather on February, so I'm glad to see your faces here today. And today we're going to have our first the, the reading and the prayer with our friend Anna, and the lecture will be our friend Denise. So, Anna, please. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So today's message is from the book Happy Life by Duval Pereira Franco by Joanna de Andres, the Spirit. God knows your destiny and commands your life. You deserve what happens to you. The goal is to reach new levels on the scale of evolution. God is the merciful Father and watches over you. Never consider yourself despised or go the way of rebelliousness and blasphemy. Man must practice courage and resignation. Without these values, he remains a spiritual child. So let's all close our eyes and elevate our thoughts. And just think of this beautiful morning with lots of sunshine on a winter day warming us. And let's thank God and Jesus, our master, and the spirit mentors of this house for this wonderful opportunity. And let's ask that we be blessed and bless our families, our friends, including our enemies who also need the help and the light. And let's open our minds and our hearts to this very important lecture today about mental in illness and depression and ask that the spirits enlighten Denise in delivering this lecture. And thank, be very thankful for all the blessings that we receive. And thank you and so be it. Please. Hello everyone, good morning. good morning. So happy to see you all here. As Anna mentioned, it's a beautiful day out there. It's like a spring day in the middle of winter. And I'm really happy to be here talking about this topic, depression. Is there an exit door? So um, before we look for the exit door, we we have other doors that we need to look into. It's like, how do we open the doors in our mind to let the depression come in? So let's understand a little bit more about this mental illness uh, before we can talk about the spiritist point of view on depression. So first, the etymology. Depression means press down. Comes, uh, the origin is from the Latin, the primary, actually the pressure. But uh, before we could find the term depression be related to the mental illness, what we could find is that melancholy was the word used to describe the symptoms that now everybody knows and is called as depression, right? And uh, the word melancholy comes from the Greek melas, that means black, plus coal, that means billy. Uh, this word comes from the ancient Greek, and the disease was thought to be an imbalance on the four basic bodily fluids. So they think that basically we had these body flu uh, fluids that they call as humors, and the prevalence of one humor in order to another was what defined our personality as more extrovert or not, these kind of things. They thought in the ancient Greek there was determined by this balance between these body fluids inside our body. And uh, as I told, personality types are similar thought to be determined by the dominant humor in a particular person. So uh, the melancholy was described as a distinct disease with particular mental and physical symptoms. And Hippocrates was one that uh, spoke about melancholy in his aphorisms, where he characterized all fears and despondencies if they last a long time as being symptomatic of the ailment. So what they realize, okay, 
they start to realize when these symptoms, when this sadness, when this feeling blue, it starts to take longer than usual, then they start to realize this is a disease, even in ancient Greek. Um, one thing that I like to share is being like, um, I grown up in a small city in the northeastern of Brazil, and in my family, I, I had a father with schizophrenia, and uh, grown up in such a small city with a person with mental illness, it's really challenged because you realize people don't believe truly in mental illness because it's not thing that is tangible. When you see someone with certain diseases that uh, you can see in their, in their skin, you can feel there's, like you can notice their symptoms, you have a tendency to have an empathy. Oh, poor guy, look, he doesn't have an arm or he has this. But mental illness is something that sometimes is a very lonely disease, right? Uh, when we think about our literature, we had so many characters that try to express this, this feeling of melancholia. When you think about uh, Shakespeare work, when you think about Hamlet, what they call as the uh, soliloquy, where he says, be or not to be, that is the moment that he shares his thoughts of suicide. He's like, he's extreme, he faced a lot, and in that moment he put out there what is he's really suffering and his thoughts of suicide. So uh, in Macbeth, Shakespeare also bring a, a character with a post-traumatic depressive disorder that we can also relate it to. And we had so many other artists like Edgar Allan Poe, Virginia, Virginia Woolf that had depression herself and died from that disease. We have Leon Tolstoy also trying to expose in his works all the things about depression, but it's hard. It's hard because people don't see, and if you really don't have the courage and don't have still the strength enough to talk about it, it's the kind of disease very silent. It's like when I learn about drowning. Everybody, when sees drowning in a movie, they think, how can nobody see this? It's drowning. Like, somebody will be screaming. There is no screaming. When someone is drowning, there's no screaming. It's silent. That's why when you go to a public pool and you see, oh my gosh, the kid died, because it's very silent. And depression is similar to that. It's a silent disease that only you, you need to diagnose yourself first to ask for help. And the person around you needs to be really, really connected to be able to perceive that you are sh that is not just a change of mood. We all have changes of mood. We all face different uh, challenges in our life that sometimes can slow down our energy a little bit because it's hard. And we are not uh, uh, in an incarnation. We know that we'll be facing challenges. And it's impossible to be happy all the time. Even though we go social media, we see everybody like in Brazil, we say uh, the buttercream family, like a family of the buttercream uh, advertising, the family that is there, perfect, the father, the mother, a girl and a boy, because, you know, this be one of it, the dog, everybody happy, happy breakfast. That's not reality. Reality is, where's your shoes? We are late. Come on. You went on the way. Let's go. This is the most common reality. And sometimes when we see this standard that television brings inside our house, that sometimes the social media brings inside our house, we put ourselves like, I don't, I don't have that, so that means I'm not happy. And if I'm not happy uh, the way I am, how can I achieve that happiness? Am I able to achieve that happiness? And you start to do these sort of questions and put yourself mm -hmm. in comparison with these people. What makes, could make your life really miserable? <laughs> because Everybody has a different personality, and you need to be trying to find this balance in your daily basis, right? So when we see in the literature, so many years ago, Shakespeare, still today, everybody here in Canada, every kid in high school will read these characters, and they were talking about these feelings, because probably it was a lot easier trying to talk through a character than to talk about his own feelings. It's really hard at that time, especially for a man, 
to go the expose like I'm suffering, I'm feeling pain, because some people has a tendency to say, oh, like it's because you're not strong enough. And even people that these days think, okay, um, I was reading the, I was watching this lecture at TED, uh, Mr. Solomon, he was a person that faced depression, now he talks about depression, and what he thought was like, he thought that he was the kind of guy that, like, if I went to a concentration camp, I will survive. That's who I thought I was. And then he faced a few losses in his life, and after uh, three years, like, he, he lost his mother, then he had a divorce, and then three years after that, that's when he started to notice that he was losing interest in the things that he liked, and he started to show some symptoms of depression. But it took him like almost six months until the point that he told that I was laying down in bed, I was in a point that I was thinking, okay, I need to eat, but in order to eat, I need to stand up, I need to go to the kitchen, I need to get a dish, I need to prepare my food, I need to warm up my food, and I need to eat. And I, I just can't do, it's too much to do all these steps. He felt like he was frozen. He was completely frozen in his bed. And he didn't have the strength even to get the phone. This one he told like in that moment and the suicide thoughts were there, were with him. And that was in this moment that he grabbed his phone, called his father and told, I need help. I'm in a really, really deep trouble. And after that, he, he looked for help, he went for medication. But look, and he told, after that, I asked myself, okay, I'm not the person that could survive the concentration camp, so who am I? What is this disease is bringing to me to make myself discover a completely different version of myself? Because sometimes we need to put ourselves in a spot, like, I need to be tough. The word, the word is hard if I'm not tough. I can survive, and you can start to live in a survival mode. But survive is not enough. We are here to evolve. In order to create this room for us to evolve, we need to do more than survive. We need to listen deeply to the concerns that our heart brings to us in our daily basis. So, uh, going back to the etymology, uh, when you talk about depression, the first time that the depression term was used in a, as a psychiatric symptom was by the French psychiatrist Louise de Lazivier in 1856. And by the, the time of 1860s, it was appearing in medical dictionaries to refer to a physiological and metaphorical lowering of emotional function. And since Aristotle's melancholia had been associated with men of learning and intellectual brilliance, a hazard of contemplation and creativity. The newer concept abandoned these associations and through the 19th century became more associated with women. So in the beginning they associated with men that lost their ability to be brilliant like they used to be. They lost this passion for life and start to act in a more like uh, sad way. But then after they start really to study, then the focus changed to the women. And we're going to see a little bit more uh, about it, right? So this is a concept of depression that you can read out there. So depression is that feeling that you get when you run out of coffee. I hope everybody got coffee this morning, everybody has energy, but like this sort of joke, but it's true in a way that when we mean coffee, mean energy is a loss of energy. But what is the actual concept that we have of depression. So I got this definition from the Institute, uh, National Institute of Mental Health. It's a website from the American government that has a lot of guidelines and has a lot of good information uh, about depression and they bring this definition to us. Where depression is a major depressive disorder or clinical depression is a common but serious mood disorder. It causes severe symptoms that affect how you feel think and handle daily activities, such as sleeping, eating, or working. To be diagnosed with depression, the symptoms must be pre present for at least two weeks. We are not talking about too much time. We are talking about two weeks. And if you 
keep thinking like you don't need too much time to start to create uh, the bad habit of thinking because uh, then we're going to talk about the spiritist point of view but when you go into this sadness and you start to feed these bad thoughts they start to build inside your brain it's hard to get rid of it it's really hard and you get like that pathological cycle of come back come back come back and sometimes you think that you lose control but you <laughs> you don't lose control you need to understand that this is your body you have the power you need to believe in that to in order to be able to stand up against the disease so according to the world health organization the unipolar depressive disorders were ranked as the third leading cause of the global burden of diseases in 2004 but will change to the first place by 2030 so we're talking here about a disease that is killing every day a lot of people and Unfortunately, the statistics show that it's just going to get worse because even though today we have a lot of different treatments, it still is a sort of disease that we know that is ruthing our soul and there is no magic pill that we can take to make it get better. So it's a really hard disease to be treated and should be taken very, very seriously. And it's not only about being sad, it really changed the way you feel, the way you think physically, your social networks will change and will be affected by that as well. First, the person will face persistently the feeling of hopeless, pessimism, guilt. Sometimes they have a beautiful family. They have the whole nine yards. They have money, they have family, they have health, they have everything. And they just start to feel this way and they sometimes don't, don't accept and they start to ignore and it's uh, the worst way to face it and the same uh, Solomon lecture he told that after one of uh, he was doing like a seminar during a whole day and in the middle of the day came this woman and start to talk to him oh I'm facing depression but and I'm taking this medication what do you think blah, blah, blah. but please don't tell anything because I didn't tell my husband and he thought, okay, and that's it. By the afternoon comes another man to talk to him. And it was her husband saying that he was also facing depression and nobody knew about it. And he was taking another kind of medication and what he thought about it. So he told like two persons facing the same disease inside the same household and they didn't have the courage to talk to each other. They're sleeping side by side and they didn't have the courage because sometimes People have a tendency to understand, oh, you are depressed, but it's because you don't like me. Or try to bring, you know, the thing. On me. But you have me, I do everything for you. And, the, like, this is not a disease about you. Unfortunately, it's a sort of disease. And as we know as the spiritists, everybody, everything comes to the roots of selfishness and pride. And depression is the, the sort of disease that is a very selfish disease. That's how it starts, but that you need to, to valid yourself in order to be able to do the, the first step. So if you, if you know anyone with depression and you, you want to start a conversation, you cannot start trying to, oh, but why you feel that? You have everything. This is not the way that you should. Because that person doesn't, like we talk about material things, sometimes even when someone, a beloved one passed away, and we say, oh, we lost this person. We don't lose people. We lost things. We can't lose a person because we are immortal spirits. We are connected through love. And that person will be beside us. Not, uh, uh, how can I say, of, of course they are evolving and everything, but there is a connection that when you really need, they will bring. As immigrants, as here, like sometimes I'm here, my family is in Brazil, and sometimes, okay, and I start to think about them, boom, they call. Sometimes there is the opposite. They're thank you, we go and call. Like, it's just a coincidence? I don't think so. I really don't think. We have these insights that we need to trust them. We need to go for it. So it's uh, really important that we believe that the connection that we have with people is really different and it's really important for our 
mental health because we are not lonely here and loneliness could be a trigger for depression as well right uh, it's a disease that we will start to change with this thought thoughts of hopeless of guilt of loneliness but then we start to escalate and then we start to have the body symptoms that's when we don't some people they will refuse to eat and they lose weight other people go to the opposite side they start to overeat and start to gain weight some people they have lack of sleep they have insomnia they can't sleep they have early awakening other people they over sleep they just don't want to get out of their bed they just want to stay there sleeping forever and this starts to escalate until it gets to the last stage where they will have the suicide thoughts and that's when we really need to be there for them because uh, when these thoughts start to come it's like uh, one of the hardest stages for people to get in because people feel ashamed. People feel ashamed of what they're feeling, they don't understand, and they keep trying to do on their own, and they don't realize that you need to, to ask for help, you need someone by your, by your side in that moment. So here we're going to see different types of depression. So the first one, that we have is the persistent depressive disorder. This is also called dysthymia. It's a depressive mood that lasts for at least two years. So this is the most severe one. A person diagnosed with persistent depressive disorder may have episodes of major depression along with periods of low severe symptoms. But symptoms must last for two years to be considered persistent depressive disorder. So this is one of the most uh, hard ones to face. We have the perinatal depression that is very common. Uh, it's not the baby blues. After women normally have the labor, they have what they call as baby blues that should take the two weeks time frame because all the hormone changes, everything is so new, the lack of sleeping, everything is overwhelming when you receive a newborn. And it's a uh, common one. But when we talk about perinatal depression, we are talking about a more complicated. It's not just the feeling uh, the baby blues, what they call. It's more severe. We have uh, the persistence of this, this feeling. Uh, woman with perinatal depression experience full-blown major depression during pregnancy or after delivery, postpartum depression. The feelings of extreme sadness, anxiety, and exhaustion that accompany perinatal depression may make it difficult for these new mothers to complete daily care activities for themselves and or for their babies. It's very common that we can hear out there, oh, it takes a village to raise a kid, but nowadays we are living more and more isolated. As immigrants, sometimes you come to another country, you have a baby, you don't have the familiar support around you, we don't have sometimes family and friends close enough that can support you, and sometimes it starts to get overwhelmed to do everything on your own. And uh, Canada is one of the countries that they, they have good programs trying to support, like during um, my own labor, like in the hospital, they really give like a lot of information to the husbands, please try to look for this, this and that. If she start to refuse to eat, if you see the lack of energy, try to really be present there because she needs you there. But sometimes even with this support, people could have the perinatal depression. And it's something that needs to be treated medically. If someone had depression before pregnancy, sometimes it's common that during the pregnancy, due to the hormones, they took out the medication and you still feel fine. But after the labor, the tendency that is going to be a really big depression. Because then when the hormones go down and without medication, you'll be feeling worse. So something that you really need to let your doctor know and be working closely about it. Uh, we have the psychotic depression occurs when a person has severe depression plus some form of psychosis such as having disturbing false fixed beliefs, delusions or hearing or seeing upsetting things that others cannot hear or see hallucinations. The psychotic symptoms typically have a depressive theme such as delusions of guilt, poverty or illness. Uh, Divaldo mentioned one of his lectures that he went to Hamburg to, to give a lecture there. And uh, during, uh, after the lecture, this family came to, to him to talk and they have a son that was paraplegic, was in a wheelchair. 
and like he was facing depression and they told that he had an episode of hallucination where he went to a train station and he really thought he was kind of the Iron Man, the, like the Superman. And he just jumped in front of the train and think that he would be holding the train. And it was really a case of psychotic, like he really had that psychotic moment. Mm -hmm. And like, as if I was told, he was completely uh, uh, changing. He was still facing depression and they're working closely. But even though he was paraplegic, like he was completely alive uh, in a way that he could see his movements and he could feel that his soul there was uh, pretty much in depression and they were working with him try to avoid any other psychotic episode. And then we have also the seasonal affective disorder is characterized by the onset of depression during the winter months when there is less natural sunlight. This depression generally lifts during spring and summer. Winter depression typically accompanied by social withdrawal, increases sleep and weight gain, predictably returns every year in seasonal affective disorder. So we live in a country that has a really harsh winter. And it's something that you need to take in consideration when they do all this advertising, vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D. You know, you need really to understand that it's different. I came from an area of Brazil that it had like sunlight, 12 hours of sunlight every day the whole year. Here, I say like 22 of December, I think is, the, is when we have like the shortest day. I start, okay, from now on it's going to get better. I need to believe because it's hard. <coughs> it's, it's 5 p.m. and it's already like completely dark. So it's another thing that you need to be checking on and understand a little bit more. We also have the bipolar disorder. It's different from depression, but it's included in this list. And it's because someone with bipolar disorder experiences episodes of extremely low moods. Thank you, Michelle. Extremely low moods that meet the criteria for major depression, called bipolar depression, but a person with bipolar disorder also experiences extremely high, euphoric or irritable moods called mania, or a less severe form called hypomania. So the bipolar disorder is even hard because they have the depression, but then the other day they feel, okay, today's a day, I'm going to do it, and then, but there is no balance in their life. It's ups and lows. There is no middle term, and that's, what really uh, brings uh, them to need to look for care in order to find a balance for their life. Um, there is other types of depressive disorders that was nearly added to the diagnostic classification that includes the disruptive mood disre dysregulation disorder diagnosed in children and adolescents and premenstrual dysphoric disorder that also now is considered a way. All of these is different. But you, you're going to see, like, when we talk about the Spiritist Bill, they all are treated the same way in a Spiritist point of view. Another uh, interesting fact is that women are about twice as likely as men to develop a major depression. They also have higher rates of seasonal affective disorder, depressive symptoms in bipolar disorder, and dysthymia, the chronic depression. And uh, another thing is also immigrants. They have a high incidence of depression themselves. Like uh, when they, they do this big change, immigrate, in the first four years, they have a high chance to develop depression when they arrive. Uh, and this is the statistics here from Canada. And let's go. But the spirit is view of depression. Another thing that I like to say is that uh, sometimes, especially in the teenage years, teenagers, you know, they change their moods. Everybody say, oh, this is the hormones. But if a teenager uh, comes from out of the blue or just because he's having a bad day or have an argument and start to say something about, oh, I'm going to take my own life, don't take that as a joke. You need to take it serious because out of anything he could have said, he decided to say something like that. So as a parent, as someone surrounded that adolescent, you need to be really taking that into consideration because that means that he already has a thought about it. He thinks about it. And in that moment, could feel like a joke, he has no reason, but that could change in a time frame that you have no idea. 
especially because they, they have a tendency to keep their lives, like their school life, uh, like social life, more to themselves. You have no idea what they're facing. And these days we see so common due to, to uh, adolescents facing bullying, taking their lives because of that. And parents completely shocked because they, they just didn't know, didn't know what they're facing. Like, it's just a shock. Okay, what have like they just don't understand. But it's something that you need to take very seriously. Be close, be attentive because it's a really, really dangerous. Uh, now, with our days, all these Snapchats, Instagram, how many other forms of bullying, they really think it's not only, <laughs> I remember, I, I say today, like, oh, because for teenagers, like, Friday is going to be the best part of my entire life. If I don't go this Friday, I'm going to die. Like, you need to start to address that issue. No, you're not going to die. And you need to talk about it. <laughs> okay, I understand that you have, you want to go, but you cannot use these terms. It's something that we really need to address since the beginning, since they are kids. It's very, very common, especially because teenagers, they have this change of moods to the uh, hormones, but they also uh, they are, are more irritable. There is other symptoms that it also matches with depression symptoms. So it's even harder for them to, to understand what they're feeling. So that's why the parents need to be really on top of the game, read about it, be attentive and try to participate of their lives as much as they can in order to help their their little ones, right? And uh, medically speaking, we also know that there is a genetic predisposition, okay, that could create. So if you know that your family has this genetic, it's common, like you have ankles, you have parents or someone facing, there is a genetic predisposition as well that could bring you a red flag and try for you to or read, understand a little bit more, and try to be aware of what you can do and what you should be looking for. So, the spiritist view of depression, right? Uh, uh, when we go to the spiritist book, um, if you try to search for melancholy, it doesn't show anything. <laughs> but then I was looking a few questions, and I thought this one was very interesting for our topic today and says, what is to be understood by natural law? The law of nature is the law of God. It is the only rule that ensures the happiness of man, for it shows him that he should or should not do, and he only suffers because he disobeys it. When I read this question, I was thinking, okay, I understand, we are the ones bringing the pain, open the door, for all these bad feelings, we are they, uh, feeding them and make them grow inside ourselves. But see this, he only suffers because he disobeys it. What we disobey, the natural law. We are surrounded by these divine laws, justice, love, charity. And these laws are the laws that make us ourselves connect to God. When we distance ourselves from God, that's when we disobey these laws. When we disobey these laws, <laughs> we are far away from God. We are trying to put ourselves away from God, right? It's very common that we, we are taken by our emotions. You are like, I, I'm someone that is really hard. Like, today I'm not going to cry, but normally I cry. Because I'm the person, like, when I see, depending on the situation, oh, I'm looking uh, news on TV and I see a really sad news, I'm the, like, I can't hold up my tears. Like, I start to cry. And when I start to cry, I cry all the time, like, for a good time. It's just not like I can turn on, turn off. Like, when I turn on, uh, I start to cry. But it's really important that we take control of these emotions. And how can we try to take control of our emotions? listen to to them it's not like when i when i see the image of uh, a kid or someone suffering and that touched myself i know i need to understand why that touched me so deep inside maybe because oh i need i need to do something about it what what should i you need to understand you need to try to listen you need to understand that you need to be in control 
of these emotions, not in a way that you're going to dictate what's going to happen and try to, okay, I'm cool with it. No, it's not that. It's just that you need to understand that you cannot act with an impulse. You cannot let this reason be just another, uh, how can I say, another argument for you to delay your progress. <laughs> we are here in this incarnation, probably the first incarnation that we are in contact with spiritism and all this knowledge that bring this, open this inner conscience of us, of the power that we have within ourselves. Now, we have no real excuse to still try to act out of our impulse in a way that we know there are going to be sorrow after, but we need to start this step back, trying to feel and understand our emotions in another way. Uh, and the body is the instrument of the soul, not the reverse. We are connected to our body through our spiritual body or the perispirit. There is a book, Andrea Louis' book, that they call as Mechanisms of Mediaship, where he explains that actually the physiology of thinking where he says when we thinking we are forming these tangible particles inside ourselves and then it starts with our spirit but then if we start for example we do something we did something wrong we realize oh my gosh that was wrong i should have done that then instead of go for forgiveness we go for guilt and we start to feel that guilt. And then we start to have these thoughts of guilt. And then that things will be tangible in our peri-spirit. And the peri-spirit will affect our physical body. And then a lot of diseases come out of it, including depression. Actually, everything that we think is a byproduct of what we do with God's thoughts. And that will be immersed in God's thoughts because we are co-creators. So we need to think that we are, God is there, we are co-creators with God, we are immersed in that thoughts, and we have the byproduct of our own thoughts. But instead of us to be creating cherry, love, empathy, uh, compassion, we go on the opposite way. And we go for selfish, we go for pride, we go for reckless, we go for all these other things that is just creating these bad byproducts that end up in our body, perispirit, creating these diseases in our body. And it's, it's how we open these doors, basically, is our, is our thoughts. And it's not easy, but that's what, this is the root. This is the basic root that we really need to look into in order to be able to achieve the, the outcome of a health, uh, mental health, physical health, everything is connected, right? We, we have all this potential for the kindness, for the empathy, but we need to, to go for it because when we go the other way, that thing will come back for us. Everything goes, everything goes back. We are sorry today. Sometimes depression is really uh, connected with anxiety and uh, when we let this connection, uh, these anxieties evolve in a way that creates a depression, what are you doing? You're not living today. And we, if we want to have a good future, we need to solve it today. We need to be preparing ourselves today. If we f you think, okay, I'm not right to do start to study until you're ready to start to do. But you need, if you want to do in the future, you need to start to study today. If you are ready to do today, great. But if not, you need to have this strategic plan. How can I try to change these bad habits that are coming back to me in these circle, circles, you know? So it's very important. Another thing uh, that I got is in the Gospel According to Spiritism, the chapter five, I think 25, where they say, uh, they talk about melancholy. And they say, do you know why sometimes a vague sadness fills your heart, leading you to consider that life is bitter? This is because your spirit, aspiring to happiness and liberty, on finding itself tied to the physical body, which acts like a prison, becomes exhausted 
through vain efforts to seek release. On recognizing that these attempts are useless, the soul becomes discouraged, and as the body suffers the influence of the spirit, it feels itself weary, apathetic, full of despondency, and it is then that you judge yourself to be unhappy. <laughs> and they also keep saying, remember, during your exile here on earth, you have a mission to fulfill that you do not even suspect. B. In dedicating yourself to your family or fulfilling the various obligations best folded upon you by God. So we are surrounded by these divine laws. In the book Evolution in Two Words, also Andrea Luis, it's a really hard book. <laughs> but uh, it's, you need to start one point. Sometimes, like, I think I read it three times <laughs> and I still don't get 60% of it. <laughs> I keep trying, but um, there is a mention that when we realize we make this wrong choice, we did this big mistake, plus the remembrance of that mistake, we create the zone of remorse in the Paris spirit. That creates another of disturbance. There will be vibrating and that, that will attract the illness, that, the change the chemistry in our, in our physical body. So see, it's it's there. And these books, we are not about books that are like, it's 2017. These books are 40 years. <laughs> it's a long time ago and they already brought all these topics to us that, as we know, depression, even though we've evolved a lot, the source of treatment is still really hard. Like the sort of medications, the side effects sometimes are really bad. It's a sort of medication that has terrible side effects sometimes. And what makes hard for people to start because they start the medication, they start to have the side effects, but then they feel, okay, now I'm better. Then they stop the medication and then everything comes over again. So it's very, it's very common. But we, we had, as a spiritist, we, we can read all these books that Chic Xavier brought to us that try to talk and try to explain to us about all the way that we open these doors, our thoughts. We are feeding them, we are opening these little doors, and that's where all this disease and all this, this bad energy come inside our body. So we need to adjust ourselves with God. Okay. <laughs> we, ad we need to adjust our relationship with God. We need to revisit our feelings, our think of God, because we are far when we are in the price, we are far away from God. And at this very moment, we have the opportunity to see you for our new future. All of us together need to make wiser choice. How many lives have we lived totally unaware of the reality? In the book Power Now by Eckhart Tolle, he says that depression is a state of the mind where people are stuck in the past. And it is true. We need to bring ourselves to the present and do the good now in order to have the future that we are looking for. Uh, here I'd like just also to mention about the depression in kids and adolescents because we know about the genetic imprints and in imprints those vibration in the perispirit so we need to really pay attention to our kids. We can start to treat this sort of disease in their childhood because during the first seven years of life they are really transformative and we need to be the scientists for our kids to look them as the immortal souls that they already are. They come with these angel faces that you just think they're so innocent. Oh, it's so, it's like, it's a brand new chapter for them. Yes, it is. But they bring all this baggage from previous life. And we need to have, as we know, that we put all these things in our spirit, spirit when they incarnate again. They are bringing this baggage with them another for another life. Because these are the, the bad habits that we face. It. So we need to observe to educate because we are the ones in charge of their education. And we need to take this opportunity to make a change in their lives, right? And how can we do that? What I talk about depression. Depression, as I say, we are far away to God. We need to bring our kids in connection with God. We need to remind them that God loves them. God loves them more than what we as parents do. And not because I don't want to love him more, it's just because I still don't know to love him how God loves him. 
So we need to bring the presence of God in their lives. They need to understand that God is there. We need to talk about God. Sometimes we do the prayer before they go to sleep, but God is there. Like when they wake up, oh, did you saw your guardian angel? Did you talk to him? How was your dream? Try to connect and remind him of God as much as we can. Mm -hmm. We need to bring God as a friend that is here with us, saying, do you know Jesus? Jesus is, is our brother. God sent him here on earth to teach us about love and try to bring his presence. When we go in a beautiful day like today, that beautiful sunlight, okay, it's a spring day during winter. Look, it's so magnificent. And see, God gave you this to us. He's given this beautiful day outside for each one of us. Maybe someone out there was with a seasonal depression during winter and needed this day to wake up and feel happier. We need to think and we, ne we need to try to bring this joy. We need to teach them that God loves them in a way that it's unimaginable. And we can't love Him the same way because God is unsurpassing. He is the one that brings all together. So it's very important that we can remember the God in all the moments and feel His presence around us through our parents, through our family, through our friends, through our spiritual uh, guides, to our guardian angels. Everybody is working together in the family that God creates. Because when we say, uh, and, and the, and and the prayer that Jesus teaches, like God, uh, God is the Father of everyone. We are assuming that it's not only He is our Father, but we are all brothers and sisters. He is the Father of all of us. And there is something that we need to keep in our minds and our hearts every day and remind our kids and enjoy the opportunity while they are small to teach them and bring this connection even stronger because word out there is not making it easier for anyone and it's not bringing this message to them each day it's more and more related to consumism to be someone if you have this if you have that and we need to bring this on the other hand and this will, will make the difference and make this reincarnation for even more important to them so let's talk about the exit door. Is there really this exit door? Of course there is. We have so many lives. They're here to learn. There is an exit door to all the mistakes we have. So, but we need to work for it, right? Um, and uh, we also have uh, science uh, try to work and help us in this regard. We had this study that was published in the JAMA. It's one of the best you know, psychiatric um, uh, journals out there, and they did the euroanatomical correlates of religiosity and spirituality. I stood in adults at high and low familial risk for depression, where they could really bring actual data, looking really through MRI, the brains, and they realized, yes, spirituality, not the frequency that they go to church, but this spirituality and this connection that they have with God really, really had a lower incidence of depression between them. And what we can do, right? Sometimes we think uh, like happiness being something that we we going to receive. Like, oh, I'm going to receive happiness. No, you need to work for it. You need to go there. And the same mm -hmm. is when we're sick, we need to look forward to try to find the help that we need and the things you can do uh, when facing depression, you start to feel the symptoms, are sick for medical care, uh, try to be active and exercise, set realistic goals for yourself. This is so important because we start to read sometimes all these books and they all have like a clear pathway, but it's really hard to put it in practice. You cannot think like, okay, I read all like, I, I read Emmanuel books and I, I, I need to be like Emmanuel because I read his books. Like, this is a realistic goal for one incarnation. You can't think, but you know what I'm saying? It's try to be, okay, what can I change today? What, uh, try to do uh, like a short goal, a long-term goal, but always trying to make yourself, challenge yourself, get out of your comfort zone in a way, 
You know, we are going to have our blood donation here. You know, oh, I never donate blood before. I'm afraid of needles, but you know, maybe today I can close my eyes and <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be quick and let's do it. You know, or okay, sometimes you are in your building, you are in the elevator, and there is that grumpy neighbor that never says good morning. And maybe you told good morning a few times and you just give up. Try again. Don't, don't let the energy of the others define who you are. If you want to be a good person, go there, try to be. Sometimes you see, my husband is very uh, uh, enforced regarding when he sees someone doing like, put a trash on the floor, he's the one that goes, hey, oh, you forgot this cup here. And the person gets like, he's very, and at the beginning I was so ashamed, like, you can do that. What I do, because I, I, I've, I, I'm shy to get to someone and say something like that. I just go and, and get and put there and look to the person like, I'm not going to let the garbage there. He's more like, hey, you forgot to. But each one find a different way of doing it, right? We need to try to spend time with other people and confide in a trusted friend or relative. So it's so important. This is also a social health. Sometimes we think about our mental health, but we need to have this social life that is part of our mental health as well. We cannot ignore that side of our life and think, oh, you know, I need, I am the way I am, and uh, I'm good with who I am, and f people don't like me. It's not that you need to be doing things just for people like you, but you need to understand if you really put everybody away from you, okay, there is something that I, I think you should be working there. You know, even if you think different, you can try to expose your ideas in a more friendly way. You don't need to be rushed. In these days of political divergence out there, you see so many fights, like everybody trying to stand on their way, and in order trying to defend their arguments, they start to offend other people, and that's not something that we, we, should, be, uh, we should be doing. We should be trying to be friendly and understand that you have pain, that person also has pain, also has their own challenges. And if you put yourself together, it's a lot easier to make things work. Try not to isolate yourself and let others help you. Ask for help. It's part of understanding, like when you talk about be uh, humble, it's not only about, oh, serve, but sometimes you need to understand that if you need help, you need to be humble enough to ask for that help. It's really important. Expect your mood to improve gradually, not immediately. So it's a progress that you're going to see. In the long run, it's not going to be, I'm taking my medication today, I'm doing psychotherapy for two weeks and I'm not feeling happy. <laughs> okay, it's going to take a lot more than that. And continue to read and educate yourself about depression. If you are facing, if you know anyone facing, try to go. As I told, I got a lot of information from the Institute of National Mental Health. They have like a lot of guidelines there that you can read and try to make you be more attentive to certain aspects. Also. Uh, what you can do, there is like these helplines, if you know someone with suicidal thoughts, really try to go close and try not to let that person alone until she really gets the proper care. So it's the, the, the little things that could really uh, make a difference. So I'd like to put a message uh, for us to listen very quickly. It's a message joy from the spirit May May, psychographed by Chico Xavier. It's a beautiful message, and in these days, it's going to be really to be.
This is the final message. Thank you so much. And I think Michelle is going to talk now. Stay there. <laughs> I can run away. So, thank you, Denise. <laughs> you stay here. I'm stay here. I'm not there. I don't care. I can stay behind. <laughs> so, any questions for Denise? Any comments? Mm -hmm. There's one comment that I just put out there. It's, uh, it's very hard for us to talk to the when we see someone acting this or that way, our first instinct is just we're judging the person. Yeah. Right? Oh, the person is always grumpy. Oh, the person that never looked at me, never replied to my emails. Oh, you saw my text and you didn't text me back. Right? Um, yeah. You don't really know what's inside anyone, despite you can see the person with a smile on on their face. You just don't know what is in there. Yeah. Uh, as you said right at the beginning, the mental health illness is. Lonely path. It's a very lonely path, mm. and uh, and also um, seeking for help is really hard, especially if you're in a spiritual environment, because you know what you have to do, and despite you know that you cannot do it, so mm. it, you judge yourself a lot all the time. How come you're acting this way? Where is this is your greatest opportunity for your testimony, <laughs> right? And you just can't do it. Yes, that's right? true. And people around you, you're, you're a spiritual person. You know, why are you feeling that way? Mm -hmm. right? It's a lot of pressure, and you cannot explain yourself, and people cannot understand yourself. That's so true. So try not to be judgmental. If you can, it's a great way of 
great strike to help out. For sure. And we we need to put in our mind this is a very difficult topic and uh, for us spiritists we have the bad uh, habit to say is the disincarnated the obsession obsessors it's because I'm, uh, I'm depressed they are obsessing me no it's our you know and it's our fault Sometimes that's why I didn't we mention connect. Obsession. Yeah, we connect. I didn't want to bring any. Uh, exactly, and uh, our today in not this new generation, and uh, we including too, is uh, social media. This is the best way to get depression because the same Denise mentioned, we see there a beautiful family or a beautiful everybody's happy. All right, everybody don't have looks like no one have struggles, and is opposite. Every single one here has your own struggle, right? So we can't connect or we can't uh, judge what I'm seeing or what, what I'm writing, all right? Or I wrote on the, the or read it on the social media or an email somebody else sent to me, and I already judge. Oh. Does it make so rude? Yeah. So, especially because with the messages and everything, it's even harder to notice something through message than when someone calls you. Because some, sometimes you can, you can hear the voice, you can guess that there is a break. In, Are you okay? Are you really okay? I don't think so. Let, let's meet in person. I, I miss you. I really want to see you. Let's meet in person. You yeah. know, but it's the kind of things when you send a message, you're already trying to filter. You think two, three times you, you choose the words, so it makes it even harder to someone to notice what you're facing. And then when we start to realize it's very hard, it's not easy. I'm telling you from my personal experience, it's not that easy. You accept you are on depression, you accept you need help. Sometimes you are put everybody away from you because you don't want to hear the yeah. truth. And I so, yeah. please help, go to find help. We yeah. have the spiritual doctors and we have the physical doctors here. Yeah. They are here not everything. for, you know, for mistakes. They are here for help us and we need yeah. this help. And we have the uh, fraternal system every Wednesday and, and Thursday. Thursday. It's very confidential, nobody else, okay, gonna c open the door and spread what's happening here so come sometimes just talk with somebody else you never know you never met before help you a lot it's more easy than somebody else you know already right and ask for help come through treatment so that's helps but first comes through us you can come here take so many pass 10 years pass but I'm not feeling better because it's Inside. The problems inside us, inside us, more connect with our problems, more difficult we go to the exit door. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult. So thank you, Denise, and let's go prepare for our pass. Mm -hmm. I would like to invite my friends to just approach a little bit more from the first um, chairs here.